Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to the Chronic Inflammation Summit, where we're getting to the root cause of chronic illness. And I'm your host, Dr. David Jockers. And today we are talking about GMOs. We're going to talk about Roundup. And we're going to talk about how GMOs are impacting and driving up inflammation and what you can do about it right now. And so for this topic, I've got an expert, Jeffrey Smith, my friend. He's a founder and executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology. He is an international best-selling author of Seeds of Deception and Genetic Roulette. And he's the filmmaker of Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives, and Secret Ingredients, some really great documentaries that uh, you'll definitely want to check out. So Jeffrey, welcome to the Chronic Inflammation Summit. Thank you, David. Great to talk to you. Absolutely. Always great to connect. And I always love seeing what you're getting into. Um, you're so well researched in this area. And a lot of people have questions when it comes to GMOs. You know, now more and more people are, are open to the idea, or at least they've seen that term now, but not, not very many people really know what a GMO is. So let's talk about that. Let's start there. What is a GMO? Uh, thank you. And I'm going to say that there is so much information on the health dangers of GMOs and Roundup herbicide, which is not only sprayed on most GMOs, who will explain why, but also on other foods, that if someone pays attention, they realize if they are interested in getting healthy or staying healthy, eating organic is a foundational step. And that I have talked to so many practitioners. I've given talks at so many medical conferences where when the doctors start prescribing non-GMO and organic diets, people get better. And when the people are not changing their diet, the same medicines and supplements simply do not do the job. Mm. And when people are eating organic, then they tend to not get those diseases and disorders that have been on the rise since the late 90s and early 2000s, and many of them are rising in parallel with the increased use of GMOs and Roundup in our food supply. And we believe it's not just correlational, we believe there is sufficient evidence to say that GMOs and Roundup are promoting more than 30 common diseases and very serious diseases. So now that I have gotten your attention, yeah, um, I'll explain what a GMO is and Roundup and all that. And then we're going to go into if the disease or disorder that your that your audience is dealing with is that possibly related to the diet and what might happen if they switch. Okay, GMO, genetically modified organism. For years, I would describe it as taking genes from one species and forcing it into the DNA of other species. But now there's gene editing where you go in and you snip different places within the genome where you can knock out genes, rearrange them, shut them off, et cetera. Both are artificial manipulations of the DNA done in laboratories. They're not natural and they create massive collateral damage, which turn into side effects. The side effects might drive up an allergen like it did in the GM soy or GM corn. Um, it might increase a toxin like it did in GM corn. It might create an anti-nutrient like it did in GM soy. All of those are unpredictable side effects that come from the background noise from the very generic process of genetic engineering. Now, most GMOs are engineered to be sprayed with Roundup herbicide. So Monsanto company, sells Roundup, they're purchased by Bayer, so Monsanto slash Bayer, the aspirin maker. And their patent for glyphosate, which is the chief poison in Roundup, was expiring in 2000, so they created Roundup-ready genetically engineered seeds so that when farmers purchased the seeds, they had to buy mm. Monsanto's version of Roundup so it was kind of a way to increase the dominance, even though the patent was going out, was expiring in 2000. So with Roundup Ready crops, soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, and alfalfa, these crops are engineered not to die when sprayed with Roundup. Roundup kills all the manner of plants, except the Roundup Ready variety. So instead of being very careful of how you spray before your crops emerge, you can just douse your fields mm. after the crops have emerged 
and you create what they call clean fields. Only the GMOs are there. All the other plant biodiversity is wiped out. Now, one of the disadvantages of spraying after the crops have emerged is that a surfactant drives the Roundup, particularly the glyphosate, into the crop, and it gets a lot of it gets deposited in the food portion. So mm. the Roundup residues are quite high. So now we're eating Roundup, which is poisonous. We're eating GMOs, which evidence suggests is also poisonous and allergenetic, et cetera. And we're eating other foods that are sprayed with Roundup three to five days before harvest to kill them, to dry them down. The, the grains, the oats, the wheat, the mung beans, the chickpeas sprayed with Roundup as a desiccant to dry them down. They don't care if they kill the crop at the end of the season. It sometimes forces the, the grains to, to ripen very quickly because, oh my God, I'm dying. Send all the energy to the offspring. And so it causes fast ripening. They do it in short growing seasons because winter's coming. So if you look at oats, it has more GMO, it has more glyphosate than the GMOs because it's wow. absorbed right in three to five days before harvest. So whether you're eating a GMO or non-organic foods, and we can explain how to figure out which foods may have a lot of glyphosate on it in a few minutes, you're getting a dose of poisons. Hmm. There's also GMOs like potatoes and apples that are engineered not to turn brown when sliced. And the way that they've genetically engineered those, we believe could reprogram your own gene expression. You eat the apple hmm. and all of a sudden you end up accidentally silencing some genes that may be important. And there's papaya and zucchini and yellow squash engineered to prevent plant viruses, we think that may possibly, based on research that virologists have done, they may reduce your defenses against viral infection, which right now is not a good idea. <clears throat> and yeah. then there's new, there's now a pink pineapple from Del Monte. So don't right. pay the $49 for a pink pineapple. Stay <laughs> away. Yeah. Are they using gene editing with that? Um, I don't believe they're using gene editing, but I don't actually know. Um, I believe they used a gene silencing thing, but I have okay. to find out. Because yeah. I just I just discovered it was on the market. It was just put on the market a couple of months ago when it was under my radar, which is very rare. If yeah, a new thing yeah. comes on, it's a big deal. Yeah, for um, sure. But I just found out recently, and I have to do a little more research. Mm. They, they had touted it for years that it was coming, but they've been doing that with a lot of GMOs, and I don't pay attention until it actually gets commercialized. Right. Now, a lot of people think when pesticides like Roundup are sprayed on plants that they're really on the outer surface. And if they wash them off really good or something like that, then they pretty much eliminated them. But what you're saying is they actually get into the root system and they actually get into the inner surface of whatever the plant is. So it's actually in the material that you're eating. Is that correct? Yeah, it goes in for, primarily through the leaves. It also goes in through the roots. About 15% go out through the roots, yeah. uh, but the rest, 80 to 85% stay in the plant. Now, it's interesting that they created a surfactant, which is very poisonous. It's illegal to use it in Roundup in Europe, but not in the United States. Um, and the same, thing, it breaks the, the cell open. It creates a little uh, um, abrasion. There's a lot of ways that it carries the glyphosate into the plant tissue. And that's also how it drives it into the skin. Now, in the recent... Roundup trials, which I was participating in, in some extent, watching it. I'm, my name was, I was named in one of the Monsanto um, yeah. emails that was used as an exhibit. Um, it turns out that they, they illegally allowed Roundup on the market. You see, they mm. have to test for um, absorption into human skin. So typically they'll take cadaver skin, skin from dead bodies, yeah. and they'll put their, their uh, herbicide on it. And about 10% of it got into the skin, which is Th more than three times the, the legal amount of absorption. So wow. they hid that information from the Environmental Protection Agency. And then they, they did a typical Monsanto research or Monsanto test. They took human skin from a cadaver and they baked it in the oven. Now, you know what happens when you bake meat? It gets really tough, but that wasn't right. good enough. They then froze it. After the deep freeze, they then added Roundup and said, oh, look, there's hardly any absorption. Mm. And they reported that absorption level to the EPA, not the real absorption level. But when they did absorption um, tests on rats, 
uh, was a specific de design to see if it promoted cancer formation. 40% of the, no, this was mice. 40% of the mice developed tumors. 40% wow. zero in the controls. And we have the, the documents where they're talking about this, saying that, that they were concerned about the full formulation and that the tumors could easily be from the full formulation. And one of the people on that email stream, I was debating in the doctor's TV show in 2015. Mm. And she was saying, it's all hunky-dory. I've been working for Monsanto for 20 years. I have a lot of confidence in this. But when you read what she actually wrote in memos that were made public from the lawsuit, she wasn't so confident. And she was concerned that certain animal deaths were from Roundup. She ghost wrote an article and eliminated the link to miscarriages, et cetera, et cetera. But we're, yeah. dri we're drifting away from inflammation. And I know some of the people may want to come back. So I will hand it back to you. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is all really important to know. And I do want to come back to the, the, the Roundup class action lawsuit because people need to know that because so many of us have eaten foods and we're still eating foods that are contaminated with Roundup. And this is a company that had, you know, multi-billion dollar lawsuit for, you know, basically show, you know, their, their, their products have been shown to cause cancer. And uh, people need to know this. Let's talk about the impact of GMOs on our microbiome. Oh boy, this is a fun story. And and we, we will get to the list of diseases, by the yes, way. Yes, we will. Like, if wondering, well, is it, in, is it influencing my insomnia? Yes, my allergies, yes. My depression, yes. My ADHD, yes. Yes, 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 yes. We can explain that. And one of the roots into that is the microbiome. So. The, we do know that the, both the GMOs and the Roundup could theoretically influence the microbiome. Um, with GMOs in the only human feeding study ever conducted on a uh, commercialized GMO, they verified that the genes that were inserted into soybeans, allowing the soybeans to be sprayed with Roundup, that herbicide tolerant gene transferred a part of it into the gut bacteria living inside the intestines. Mm. Now, this could have a lot of implications. For example, there's corn and cotton, well, the cottonseed oil wouldn't have it, but the corn and soy that have BT toxin producing genes, mm. genes that produce a toxin that kills insects by breaking open little holes in their guts and in a laboratory with high concentrations, it pokes holes in human cells that look exactly mm. alike it's possible if the genes that produce this toxin enter the DNA of the gut bacteria and produce the toxin, it could theoretically turn our intestinal floor into living pesticide factories. Yeah. That BT toxin can then drive holes in intestines, in humans, and it's at least in the laboratory, yeah. possibly in the gut. It also can promote an allergic and immune system reaction as done as shown in farm workers who use the natural BT spray as well as mice. So it elicits a major immune system reaction and it creates a sensitivity in mice for formerly harmless compounds. And so if you end up with BT in your system, you may end up allergic to other things you know, egg, eggs, egg yolks, or yeah. peanuts, or whatever, because it can sensitize. And they found that in Canada, 93% of the pregnant women tested had BT toxin in their blood, and 80% had it in their unborn fetuses. Wow. Now, how did it get in their blood? And it should be washed out pretty regularly. So Probably they were from eating. openings in their gut, I would imagine. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Po possibly by the BT toxin, or yeah. as we'll find out in a minute, by the Roundup. So that's one way that the gut bacteria is affected. It might be colonized. Another way is through Roundup. Now, Roundup is a, has glyphosate, which is a patented antibiotic. Antibiotic means it kills bacteria. But unlike any bac antibiotic that I know about, it's preferential and it kills the beneficial stuff the lactobacillus, yeah. the bifidobacteria, not the E. coli, the salmonella, the botulism, right. clostridium. So it turns out that it causes, and they've run a human microbiome into a, a uh, simulated 
um, program with actual, you know, you can, you can actually feed this thing. They fed it for two or three weeks with food after they put a human uh, fecal matter in, and then they fed it with some Roundup in there, and they looked at the microbiome, and they found that it reduced the diversity, it mm. reduced the beneficial bacteria, it increased the pathogens, it reduced the beneficial metabolites, the short chain fatty acids, et cetera. Yep. And I remember sitting with Kieran Krishnan who did the research yep. and I said, okay, I'm gonna go through 28 different conditions that people reported getting better from when they switched to non-GMO and largely organic food. I'll show everyone yep. that list in a moment. And I said, okay, can you tell me the metabolic pathway that based on your results in your fake human gut, could it have initiated or exacerbated this disease or this disorder or this disease? And he was, it was like defending a PhD. He yeah. was like, yes, it could do this. And he was describing all the different ways that the changes in the gut microbiome could lead to an increase in these particular diseases, which we'll see in a minute. And he he just he believes that you know changes in the gut microbiome can lead to eighty percent of the diseases yeah. or more, and that glyphosate is the most used antibiotic in the planet, two hundred eighty million pounds in agriculture alone, and it is something that is in the air, it is in the rain, it could be in your your water faucet, and it's mm -hmm. definitely in the food supply, and so that's that's one way that it ends up hurting the microbiome. Another way is that the microbiome use, certain bacteria use what's called the shikimate pathway. You don't mm -hmm. have to memorize shikimate pathway. Yeah. It's a particular system that bacteria use to create three friends of ours, tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine. Mm -hmm. Now the tryptophan and the tyrosine, they're used to produce two really good friends of ours, serotonin and and uh, dopamine. dopamine and the serotonin mm -hmm. makes melatonin. So we have serotonin, melatonin and dopamine that are the feel good chemicals, the sleep chemicals, mm -hmm. the don't get into pain chemicals, don't have anxiety and depression chemicals. And now glyphosate stops the shikimate pathway from functioning. It blocks it. Mm -hmm. So why is it that with that since GMOs and Roundup were introduced to the food supply in the late 1990s, that anxiety and depression yeah. are skyrocketing and sleeplessness and other sleep disorders yeah. and pain and Parkinson's, which is related to dopamine. And yeah. we think that it is the neurotransmitters that are suppressed by the action of glyphosate on our mm. gut bacteria, which, and you know, 90% of the serotonin is from in the gut. Yeah, The gut is all important. And so that's another way that the gut bacteria influence uh, are influenced by GMOs and Roundup. Yeah, it's so key. Whenever we think about chronic inflammation, really the first thing we need to look at is what is happening in the gut. And what you're saying here is that glyphosate and GMOs in general are causing intestinal permeability, the state of leaky gut, and also dysbiosis, where we're getting an abnormal increase in pathogenic bacteria that are producing endotoxins that cause that drive up inflammation, things like salmonella and different types of E. coli and Clostridia species. And we're losing the good bacteria, the lactobacillus strains, the bifidobacterium. Those are the ones that produce the anti-inflammatory compounds, the short chain fatty acids, the B vitamins. So now people are ending up with a, a reduction in the kind of anti-inflammatory compounds coming out of their gut and an increase in the pro-inflammatory compounds. No wonder why we have a state of chronic inflammation. It's affecting our brain like you talked about. Let's take a look. Let's do a little screen share here because Jeffrey sent me this, uh, these slides here that give a great uh, overall uh, representation of what is happening. And we're going to talk about how these, these different conditions are impacted by GMOs. So well, right at the top there, we got digestive problems. Right. So 85.2% of the people we surveyed, and we surveyed 3,256 people, 85% of them said that they had improvements in their digestive digestive problems when they switch to a non-GMO and largely organic diet. Now, why did I ask about these 28 different conditions in a survey? Because I asked people at about 150 lectures, 
what diseases or disorders did you get better from when you switched to non-GMO and or organic? And digestion was always the number one. And here it is again, mm. by far the number one. So I published these results in the International Journal of Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine. They peer reviewed it first. And I went into a deep study as to why digestion may be impacted. I listed all the different studies that talk about gut bacteria, the leaky gut that's linked to Roundup. You can just do in a Petri dish, human epithelial cells, you add glyphosate and they separate. So you can see the gut bacteria between the cells, the Bt toxin poking holes inside cells, the damage to the microvilli along the walls. And if you look at the digestive problems as I included in the peer reviewed article, there has been a skyrocketing in parallel with the increased use of GMOs and Roundup in the United States of irritable bowel, of inflammatory bowel, of peritonitis, of digestive, of, of deaths due to intestinal infection. And so many people at these lectures would, would say that their digestion got significantly improved. Now, if you think 85% said, okay, my digestive, my digestion improved. We broke it down even further. Of those 85%, 80% of them either said it was significant improvement, hmm. nearly gone or completely recovered. So we're talking about the vast majority of the people on that bar had a significant improvement or completely recovered to their digestive problem. And inflammation is one of the issues that's associated with digestion. If you look at the process of genetic engineering, there's a beautiful study out of uh, the Aberdeen Institute in Scotland done by my friend, Dr. Arpad Pustai. Before I even knew him, he was the world's leading researcher on GMOs because he had done the most extensive evaluation of it for the, for the UK government. He was creating a protocol that was supposed to be designed for uh, the, the filtering process, the acceptance process of GMOs throughout Europe. And when they discovered that there was a problem generically, he was fired from his job and silenced mm. with threats of a lawsuit. And it was a horrible situation. I cover that in my book, Seeds of Deception. But he showed this potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract from the animals that ate the GMO potatoes, but it had nothing to do with the particular gene that was inserted into the potatoes. It was the generic process of genetic engineering, mm. the same process that's used around the world and the GMOs that are eaten. And I remember Dr. Michelle Perro, who's a pediatrician, looked at those slides of the very large gut, uh, gut protrusions in the, in the guts of the stomach and intestines of the rats and realized this is what was going on in her children. She was, she was seeing a whole new raft of diseases and disorders in the, in the children in her practice that she had never seen before and it was very hard to treat. And then she started putting them on organic diets and lo and behold, some got better just from the change in food and some got better because they were handling the exacerbation that had been brought, up, brought about by the GMOs in the Roundup. Okay, so digestion is, a lot of people know that digestive problems lead to many other diseases. Yeah. The gut bacteria, for example, leaky gut, for example. And so that is, if you can get that under control, and so if anyone has the digestive problem or think that digestion is related, switch to organic immediately. And when you switch to organic, take notes. <clears throat> Write down your energy level because you'll see the number two mm. is fatigue. So you may not even be paying attention to fatigue or energy level. And you may forget <laughs> and not realize that when you switch to organic, you have all much more energy. Uh, <clears throat> and the reason why you may have more energy, among other things, is not only your body not having to deal with the, the extra energy related to inflammation, but research shows that glyphosate damages the mitochondria. And I was talking to my friend, Zach Bush, and he could see it under a microscope, how it damages actin, which are like the, the, stru the, the structural integrity of the cells. It damages that, the mitochondria implodes and gets destroyed. And the mitochondria is the energy producers some of our cells have hundreds or thousands of mitochondria in them. And without that, we end up fatigued and with brain fog. So the number two response that was consistent among all groups for the 150 lectures was how many people noticed a reduction in fatigue 
and brain fog. And that was always too behind digestive problems. And of course, overweight and obesity, a lot of people are concerned about that. 55% of the people said that they lost weight. And there's a lot of reasons why that may be the case. I'm not exactly sure. There's no, there's so many different reasons. It's hard to, it could be part of a gut bacteria, the ability to digest, et cetera. So um, as you can see, mood problems, anxiety or depression, 51%. We already talked about the serotonin and melatonin, food allergies and sensitivity, that can relate to inflammation, it can relate to leaky gut, the immune system can get activated. In that same study that was done by Dr. Arpad Pustai, he found damage to the immune system. There's the BT toxin we already talked about as creating an immune system response. And there's many ways that allergies and sensitivities can be promoted. And um, if you look down memory and concentration, that can be related to brain fog and to mitochondria, joint pains related to inflammation as well. There's a lot of seasonal allergies and other inflammatory. In fact, I think, David, you could probably relate inflammation to most of these, but there's other aspects of the modes of action of GMOs and Roundup. For example, if you look down to cancer, 4.8%, that was about 255 people in the study. The World Health Organization's Institute um, for uh, IARC, International Association for Research on Cancer, determined that glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen, a class 2A carcinogen. And we have studies showing that cancer, certain cancers are rising in relationship to the introduction of GMOs and Roundup. We know the modes of action, those have been well, well evaluated. And a lot of people would who may be have cancer because of Roundup may not necessarily see it improve when they switch to a non-GMO and organic diet. So even though it's only 4.8%, the impact may be much mm -hmm. higher and hidden by that. Yeah, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, every one of these conditions is associated with inflammation. A lot of people don't think things like weight, like being overweight or obese are related to inflammation, but inflammation impacts our hormones. So it can, it can cause hypothyroidism, which can affect uh, your weight. It can affect insulin resistance. I know I see diabetes down there as well. Um, so inflammation drives that and it goes hand in hand with diabetes, with, uh, with just a state of pre-diabetes or insulin resistance, that's going to cause you to have trouble burning fat for fuel. So every single one of these conditions is associated with inflammation. That's why this topic is so important for this summit. If we're looking at chronic inflammation, we've got to understand the impact of GMOs on our diet. And another thing is the gut bacteria. There's certain um, gut bacteria that promote uh, you know, overweight and certain promote underweight. So yes. this was just a, a drill down, just again, food allergies and sensitivity, just to show you these are not minor improvements, that 76% had at least significant improvements, nearly gone or complete recovery. So the, the largest the largest categories were significant improvement and nearly gone for allergies and food sensitivity just from, in many cases, just from changing out to non-GMO and largely organic. So on uh, many of the research, many of the 28 conditions you just saw also, significant nearly gone or complete recovery are the more likely response than mild improvement. It's really compelling. So you said this is over 3,000 people yeah, that took the survey. Yeah, so you can see that going on an all organic diet is certainly a great first step to starting to get this inflammation under control. So what is the difference between non GMO because there's non GMO certified when we're looking at foods and organic? And are there foods that, you know, we may be able to get non organic or at least not certified organic that should still be fairly safe from GMOs? Excellent question. You're channeling every one of your audience. <laughs> yeah, right. Because they want to know that. That's great. All right. So let me answer all of this. I'm going to do it slowly because people may want to take notes here. Okay. Non GMO means that there are no genetically engineered organisms being intentionally used, and different types of certifications have different requirements. The best one is the non-GMO project, that butterfly that's 
found all over now, and they have the most stringent requirements. So they don't allow some of these new GMO 2.0s, they don't allow intentional use, but sometimes there's still contamination. The nature of nature, you know, you plant non-GMO and GMO next to each other and, and there can be contamination yep. through the wind, in storage and transport, human error. <clears throat> so with the non-GMO project, if there is an ingredient in there that might be contaminated, then they'll do a test or they'll require the company to do a test in an accredited lab and submit those results directly to the non-GMO project. And so they have an action threshold of 0.9%. So if the company is consistently below 0.9%, but still is contaminated, they'll still get the seal. Mm -hmm. Some are zero. Now, everyone's trying to get zero, but once, once it's released, you can't clean it up from the gene yeah. pool. You can do your best to isolate, pick the right seeds, et cetera. Now, organic products are also third-party certified, and they are not allowed to intentionally use GMOs, but contamination can occur. <clears throat> organic standards do not require testing. So when it comes to GMOs, you might have a higher percentage of contamination with organic if it's not also non-GMO project verified. So if you have the two together, it's a mm. little better because it means that it's not only not allowed to contain GMOs, but there's been some testing if right. any ingredient might be contaminated. But there's a much more compelling reason if you had to choose between organic and non-GMO, organic is the way to go. This is important. Mm. Here's why. Let's say you have oatmeal with the butterfly. Not organic. It may be filled with glyphosate. Hummus, same thing. Mm. Bread, same thing. Mung beans, dal. Uh, orange juice, uh, wine, beer, all these can have glyphosate residues. The non-GMO is true. There are no genetically modified organisms in the okay. orange juice, in but the wine. Pesticide. But the Roundup was sprayed uh, on the rows between the wine grapes, on the mm. orchards of the oranges, um, on the, crop, on the um, grains and beans directly as a desiccant. And so you don't want to be eating a loaf of bread or, or oatmeal that's packed with glyphosate. So you want to go organic. Now, suppose you can't get organic for whatever reason. Sometimes you'll see a certification called glyphosate residue free, which means they've tested for glyphosate and they have no, no detectable levels, then they get a certification. So that tells you even if it's not organic, at least that poison is not found. There may be atrazine and other poisons, but that poison is not found. The other way is, if you know your farmer, you go eat at a, at a farmer's market, you know they don't spray, you grow your own. And finally, there are some products that are more likely to contain glyphosate residues than others. And you can find a complete list of all the different tests that, that nonprofits have done and made public. Our Institute for Responsible Technology at responsibletechnology.org. Right at the top, you can enter your information and get sent to you a link where we have all the different products that have been tested, both the raw ingredients, the different fruits and vegetables and grains and beans, as well as the finished products, the craft this, the Nabisco this. Anyone that's done any testing, we gather all that information from the public domain and put it together in a report so that if you happen to want to know if avocados which are supposedly in the clean 15 from, but they don't pay attention to glyphosate. Does it have glyphosate? What's the residues? So can you afford to eat non-organic? People think, can you afford to eat organic? It's actually the opposite. Can mm. you afford to eat non-organic? We have so many people who have told us in the movie Secret Ingredients, people switched to organic. They got better from all these different diseases. Two autistic kids in the spectrum. This is a film I did with Amy Hart. Two kids who were autistic are no longer on the spectrum. A, a, wow. a um, clinic that had, a chiropractic clinic that 
finds themselves treating a lot of infertile couples. Why? Because at this point, they had 123 infertile couples that came to them and all of them have children. No fails. Everyone that followed the protocol has children. And, wow. and the protocol is eat organic as well as the chiropractic. Um, we have people that got better from all skin problems and, and anxiety and depression and brain fog. And, and we see clearly that the organic is driving those things when you look at the nature of what's, what's going on with these people. So organic is the number one. If you can't eat organic, look at the list at responsibletechnology.org or look for other indicators. And if you can't do anything else, at least avoid GMOs, because GMOs could have not only the toxin of Roundup, but it has the GMOs, which I think are very dangerous for health. So what foods are most commonly GMO? Well, soy, corn, cotton, no. canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, cotton is made for cottonseed oil. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the new pink uh, uh, pineapple. Don't go there. Yeah. We have the pre-sliced apples because you want to cut the apple. They're called Botox. We call them Botox apples. They right. lie about their age. Could be, you know, a lot could be very old, but you can't tell because they don't turn brown. Potatoes that are, have a similar don't they don't tell their age. They they hide their bruises. There's a lot of, it's interesting, the person that mm. created that potato, the genetic engineer that created that potato wrote a book after he retired calling it the worst GMO and talked wow. about how it could reprogram human genes, how mm. it could hide the impact of toxins and all sorts of things. So he he had a, a big awakening when yeah, he looked at it. And then we have zucchini, yellow squash, and papaya. The papaya would only be from Hawaii or China, and it wouldn't be the organic zucchini or yellow squash and it's not all non-organic zucchini and yellow squash yeah. but you won't know because they don't they don't label it okay so there's not like a specific uh code on it or anything like that no. No. and how about how about meat so here's the deal organic products are are supposed to be feeding only organic feed yeah so that's that's a, a standard a uh, grass-fed can be grain finished right so if it just says grass-fed it may not tell you that it's grain finished and the grain is typically GMO corn soy. Yeah. It can say 100% grass fed. And then your, your consideration is, did they plant GMO alfalfa? Hmm. Typically not. Typically GMO alfalfa is used for dairy cows, hmm. but it's possible. So you may want to contact the 100% grass fed yeah. company and say, do you feed, uh, do, your, do they graze on any place that is, have planted GMO alfalfa. And then there may be a little bit of molasses and other things they may give to the grass-fed animals that might come from GMOs, but it's a very, very small percentage of their diet. So grass-fed, wild-caught mm -hmm. animals, you know, wild-caught fish, game are usually okay. Sometimes right. they'll stock lakes with, yeah. with um, trout that they've raised on genetically modified soy pellets. Um, sometimes the... the um, the, the deer that you're shooting have been eating the corn and the nearby, but, mm. but it's generally yeah, wild yeah. caught. So organic grass fed, hundred percent grass fed wild caught, or, you know, the farmer and you find right. out what's been, what's been like, there's a, there's a meat I saw recently that was non-GMO project verified, non-GMO project verified meat means that they know that the animals have not been fed GMOs. There yeah. might be some glyphosate in there, but less likely because the, most of the Roundup is sprayed on the Roundup ready grains. So that's also much cleaner. Yeah. Now, you know, obviously eating an all organic diet is a great recommendation, but for some people, it's going to be really hard for them to do. Are there specific things that people can do, like maybe certain binders or, you know, any sort of supplements that you know of that can help support the body in its ability to detox glyphosate or anything else we're being exposed to? You know, I was asked that question. I've been doing this for 25 years, right? And I've asked that question. It was the number two question everyone asked me, what else can I do? The number one is how do I avoid? And then how do I fix? And for years, I'd answer only one way. It's above my pay grade. I'm not a doctor or a healer. Right. But then I started interviewing some doctors and healers and scientists who were addressing that. So Dietrich Klingar told me he had a whole glyphosate uh, detox res uh, res uh, regimen. I talked to Kieran Krishnan. He had a way yeah. to, to reverse the thing. Uh, um, Zach Bush, 
Lee mm-hmm. Cowden, Joe Mercola, all these people. So I did, I put together a Healing from GMOs and Roundup program where I interviewed 18 experts. Um, but I did not and will not try to boil it down to the best because that's above right. my pay grade. It's it's like, I I can't answer the question, but I'm overqualified to ask the questions. <laughs> so I asked them lots of questions about, because glyphosate was originally patented as a chelator to descale industrial boilers and pipes mm. because it grabs minerals. So you know that it's grabbing the minerals in the in the food that's been sprayed, in the animals that are eating it, and directly as we get the residues in us, so we have mineral deficiency, we have gut bacterial problems, we have mitochondrial deficiency, we have leaky gut, we have um, problems with the DNA structure, which can lead to cancer, we have birth defect issues, things, and also Roundup can pass on inherited epigenetic problems to the next generation with new research just came out five days ago. So we understand what can break down. So yes, there are binders, Yes, there's opening of the detox pathways. Yes, you want to replenish the gut bacteria. Um, but I'd rather not pick and choose from these brilliant experts that gave me examples. Fasting is obviously, I mean, you're yeah. an expert at that. You can speak mm-hmm. about that all day long yeah. and how that helps the detoxification pathways. Saunas, you know, all those things work. So what's yeah. interesting is that when you target glyphosate, glyphosate blocks the ability of the liver to detox other toxins because mm. it damages the detox pathway, the P450 cytokine pathway. So it, it, all other toxins may be, not all the ones that are normally released through that pathway are less likely to be ushered out of the body. So now if you can get rid of glyphosate, you get rid of those. There's also a detox pathway in the cells called NRF2. It went down dramatically in a lab t- study where they added glyphosate. So, um, and there's ways to block that. There's ways to stop that reduction. So you have a situation where if you can pull out the glyphosate and stop taking it in by eating organic, then so many other things function better. And you look at the, at what glyphosate does, it is as if it attacks every foundational system. Yeah. The, the structure of the DNA, the mitochondria, the gut bacteria, the mineral absorption, the, you know, all of them. And so it is like, I called it the Darth Vader of chemicals because it is so evil in what it does. Mm. And it's it's so, it gets everywhere. And some of it ends up being deposited in our tissues and our bones, which is probably why non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is the, is the type of cancer where it has all this particular um, research, which has allowed these lawsuits and a settlement of about $10 billion. So yeah, it's pretty bad. So I think people yeah. by now have gotten that. I think I better just shut up about how bad it is and think about how to do better. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, you know, obviously this is all compelling information that, I mean, really should inspire us to, to choose organic and just choose our foods more wisely. That's for sure. And choose our lifestyle strategies. You know, all the different things like you talked about, right? Supporting the liver, supporting the microbiome, supporting detoxification pathways. And we have a lot of other experts that are talking about those things, including people like Kieran Krishna. Uh, who's who's in this summit as well? Let's talk about you know we had we had kind of touched earlier on the class action lawsuit. So let's go back to that. What actually happened here? What were the results? And what does this mean going forward? Well, there's at least three things here. One is the fact that millions of documents were made public, and I mean we I've known for years the the horrible ways that Monsanto manipulates science and captures regulatory agencies. But there was some new stuff in there that I had never seen. And also what we knew but didn't have proof, we now have black and white. So we realize the extent of the massive fraud, how the very first study that they did on on glyphosate was done by a laboratory, industrial biotech. It was was a complete fraud. 100% 100% fraud. One of Monsanto's executives worked for IBT when they were doing Monsanto studies and they went back to Monsanto. He went to jail. He went to wow. jail because it was such fraudulent research. So then we realized that they had hired a, a someone, Dr. Parry, the world's expert at, at um, a certain way that toxins can create cancer. Um, and so he was looking at that and found, oh yeah, Based on the research that Monsanto executives sent me, it looks like it causes 
it can be leading to cancer. And they said, what, what? Has he ever done research for, for industry before? Doesn't he know he's not allowed to do that? So they ignored his report. They were legally supposed to turn it over to the EPA and they commissioned their own report. But how do they commission it? They ghost wrote it. A ghost wrote a review study where it came to the exact opposite conclusion that it was uh, um, that it damaged the DNA, could lead to cancer. Yeah. And they paid scientists to put their name on it. And that became one of the um, articles that was used by regulatory agencies to allow it on the market. Then we have dialogues back and forth between people at the EPA and Monsanto showing that they had their own lapdogs working for them at the EPA. They were working on their behalf. We have the, the names of them, we have the documents. So that was one thing that the, that the trials did is that they exposed it in black yeah. and white. The second was the actual details. Um, the, the International Agency for Research on Cancer verified that glyphosate is a probably human carcinogen. The most research was done on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so there, were, there was someone that wanted to sue. And so there was a um, groundskeeper, Lee Johnson from Benicia uh, School District in the Bay Area who was dying uh, and they rushed his, um, his trial to move forward before he died. Yeah. And, you know, when Monsanto sold itself, when they allowed Bayer to buy it mm -hmm. for 63 billion, they said, oh, we're putting aside 260 million for all of the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma lawsuits. Well, the jury awarded Lee Johnson $295 million. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was one, right? It was later brought down by the by the judge, but and the next one, the next two, they also lost. Monsanto also lost one. The jury awarded two billion in punitive damages. That was also brought down, but that basically drove all these class action lawyers to start advertising for clients. Yeah, and so they started negotiating with Bayer that bought Monsanto and feels regretful that they did, and so. They're negotiating about a $10 billion settlement for about 125,000 um, plaintiffs, not even all the plaintiffs that there are. And they've been saying, okay, we settled, but no, we didn't. And we settled, but no, we didn't. And they try to renegotiate. Absolutely, they're absolutely horrible, this Bear Monsanto combination. But some of them have been settled. And so that's the actual round of trial. The third piece is the impact around the world. Governments have been shutting down their support. Uh, companies mm. have been shutting down their support. Individuals are aware of it for the first time. So the impact around the world has been a blessing yeah. that these trials have given people much clearer awareness of what's actually going on. Yeah, for sure. And now most of these trials are centered around using Roundup as a herbicide like on your lawn right? right or like in the groundskeeper's case he's spraying it all day long on you know football fields and stuff like that they're not really related to the food that we're eating at this point but we with still an exposure just the Absolutely. overall exposure to the fact that this is a, a toxic chemical and uh, it's linked with cancer and now people are being more open to that so i think that's you know that's a huge win in this case and the thing is, what's interesting is that when you look at glyphosate and its effects on the human body, some are handled at very, very small doses and some require larger doses. Yeah. Uh, we know for certain chemicals that are called, um, that are endocrine disruptors, tiny amounts can have a bigger impact than increased amounts. So the, there's a U curve. It's like very high impact from very small amounts. Then you increase the amount and the impact goes down. Mm bottoms out and then it goes up again, but there's not the hormone, that's not the endocrine thing, that's this. That's the poison, the toxin effect. Right, there's right. a hormonal effect over here and a toxic effect over here. Mm. Now, we know that in parts per trillion, glyphosate caused non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in rats. And the EPA doesn't pay any attention to the low dose effects. They're still 20 years behind in their science. <clears throat> ignore reams of evidence that certain chemicals can cause these endocrine disrupting effects at tiny doses, and they don't pay any attention to them. So it turns out they allow glyphosate in the water supply on a per body weight, per day basis, that 
would be 437,500 times more than the amount of glyphosate that was fed to these rats on a per body weight per day basis that mm. resulted in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, if a tiny amount of glyphosate causes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the human system, we would expect, because glyphosate is used throughout the food supply, that a large number of people would have it. Well, about 30% of Americans, maybe 35, I've heard different stories, yeah. have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, you can tell how much glyphosate you're eating by looking in the urine. Most of it leads to the urine. If you look at the people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, there's they looked at two different types, the more severe one and the your random standard one. They took the urine from this group and they found that those that had higher levels of glyphosate in their urine had the more severe non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Mm. And so this enormous epidemic, which is a precursor to uh, serious, like to liver cancer, yeah. for example, could be completely driven by glyphosate in our food supply. Huh. And because we know the most the most damning research of all the research was this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, because I looked at the molecular characteristics, what was happening on the level of the of the um, the different the transcriptome, the the all the very, very fine changes in the gut as a result of this diet compared to controls. So hmm. it's something that could be having an effect on yeah. billions of people right now. Totally. And you mentioned drinking it in our water. So what kind of water filtration system is good? Can you get like a good, strong carbon system? Can that pull it out? Do you need a reverse osmosis, like a whole house system? Reverse osmosis um, tends to do it. Yeah. Um, I uh, We've investigated some. There's a hydrogen version that works. Like, yeah. If I were to if I were to talk about something in terms of water, I make sure that they've done the tests. I tell them which right. lab to go to. The lab takes the equipment, they put in water with glyphosate, and they yeah. test the water that comes out the other side. And so, on the, so you have to ask them which ones, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so I would say I'll leave it up. I don't want to give a particular promotion to one because there yeah. may be others. Mm -hmm. You may have one that you want yeah. to recommend. Do you have any information on that on your website? At livehealthybewell.com. Okay, live healthy and be well. Yeah. Live, live healthy, be well .com. When you sign up for our newsletter, we send out information on different products that we've verified for testing. Good um, to know. Like the best sauna that we could find that has yeah. the, the full spectrum infrared instead of the right. partial, the, yeah. the water purifier, the air purifier, et cetera. Uh, but I don't want to run counter to what products that you may be suggesting, but I think it would be important for you and everyone yeah. to ask these questions. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, all good things to know. I mean, we, we need to make sure we're doing our best to minimize our exposure to this stuff as much as possible. It's, it's almost impossible to eliminate it unless you go to, I don't know, the Himalayan mountains or something like that. Um, but if you live in you know the United States or a, or a westernized world, you're going to have some level of exposure. Your body can adapt to small exposures, but you got to do everything you can to try to minimize it. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway here. So organic diet, trying to get good filtration on your water system. Um, you know, certainly not spraying it on your yard. Uh, you know, <laughs> trying to do your best to avoid things like that. I want to add one thing, David. Um, the biotech industry is trying to claim that gene editing is safe and predictable. It is clearly yeah. not. I mean, it's, it is clearly a disaster. But they've been able to convince governments that turn a blind eye to gene edited everything. Now, gene editing is very cheap. It's dangerous, but it's very inexpensive. You can buy a do-it-yourself kit for $169 at, at Amazon. I don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. So you can create a completely new organism that has never been part of the billions of years of wow. evolution for $169. If mm -hmm. you create a viable organism and you release it in the environment, you have altered the gene pool for all future generations because we have no technology to recall it. Now, imagine that there are companies like Monsanto that have facilities full of robots driven by artificial intelligence for massive production. And imagine that because DNA is so inexpensive to manipulate that virtually everything with DNA is being targeted. 
from bacteria to butterflies, from algae to animals, from flowers to fungus, everything. So if we don't stop it, then by the end of this generation or the next, we may have replaced nature. Eliminating the products of the billions of years of evolution and sentencing all future generations to only deal with the folly of this generation, which is laboratory creations based on a technology whose number one most common result is surprise side effects. We can see by understanding the nature of nature that this could cause ecosystem collapse. This could create not only catastrophes, but cataclysms. And so at responsibletechnology.org, we are, we are promoting a whole new movement, not mm -hmm. focused on eating, healthy, although that support certainly supports mm -hmm. the change in agriculture, but on locking down the introduction of GMOs, starting with microbes, because those will yeah. spread, as we know from, from pandemics, that, they'll, that whether they're GMO or not, the microbes can spread around the world, crossing borders, wreaking havoc. With genetic engineering, you can enhance the, the ability for a pandemic pathogen to cause problems, like they've done. You can also create bacteria that can cause serious problems. We have a short video that talks about how a certain bacteria that was almost released could have theoretically ended terrestrial plant life in the planet, hmm. cataclysm. Wow. Another one that could have altered weather patterns on the earth for forever, potentially, uh, theoretically, but was not released or, or was destroyed after it was released. So the this is our new focus. Yeah. You know, we, 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 as you can tell, I've been well-schooled on the GMO and Roundup mm -hmm. dangers, and I'm happy to share it. But right now, we need to educate the entire planet that we have arrived at an inevitable time in human history where we can easily redirect the streams of evolution for all time, but we don't have the technology, the morality, the ethics, and the, the, the foresight to do it in a way that's safe and predictable. The technology is not ready for that. It may never be. We don't yeah. know, but it's certainly not there now. And we need support because I'll tell you, I, I've spoken it uh, to live audiences before the pandemic, eight different groups asking them which they thought would be a greater damage to the planet, to survival, GMOs or climate change. And all eight said GMOs. Yeah. They were, they, some of them were climate change conferences. So wow, really? it's, it's a serious issue mm -hmm. and hardly anyone knows about it. So yeah. please go to responsibletechnology.org, sign up. And there's going to be a video there for you to watch. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for all the great work that you do, Jeffrey. Thank you for this wonderful interview. This has enlightened our, our listeners. And guys, definitely go to Jeffrey's website. Uh, go ahead and sign up there. That way you can be a part of this movement. Because just like he said, you know, we've got to put our, we've got to get our voice out there and uh, we've got to make a difference here. And so thanks again, Jeffrey, for, for everything that you're doing. We, we appreciate you so much. And for those of you guys that are out there listening, now it's time to go out and take action. You learned a lot right here. So go out, start taking action and improve your health. Be blessed, everybody.